Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, the rush to respond as more Canadian cases of Omicron are caught. Everything is so uncertain. I will be more cautious just until we find out a little more about the variant. What it means for you, from booster shots to airport testing and travel bans. We're just hoping to get home for sure before Christmas. Also tonight, BC's relentless rain packs another punch. This flood has kept me up at night. We know we have another couple tough days ahead of us. Nervously watching the rivers as the last big storm starts tonight. Leaving the queen behind. The inevitable is happening. The British monarchy has fallen like a leaf in autumn. It's a party in Barbados tonight as it becomes the world's newest republic. And why you shouldn't wait if you're looking for a real treat. This is The National. Yet again, the pandemic has put science on the clock, a high-pressure race to pin down the Omicron variant. How transmissible is it? How virulent? How easily does it evade immunity? The problem is those answers could take weeks, and Omicron is already here. Yesterday, Canada had two confirmed cases. Now there are five. So that's four cases in Ontario, one case in Quebec, and more potential cases under investigation. When Alpha and then Delta came here, days and weeks mattered when it came to the response. Mm -hmm. But it's not at all yet clear if Omicron is as dangerous. And as Rafi Bujikanian explains, the response now seems to be focused on fighting the variant by finding it first. The first two confirmed cases of Omicron, travelers returning to Ottawa, were found by chance. We were fortunate to pick up this, uh, the, these two cases from Nigeria, given that it was part of a, a random testing strategy. Recent and officials soon found more. We are now aware of two other returned travelers who have tested positive for the Omicron variant. A first case of the new variant has been confirmed in Quebec. Now provinces are asking the federal government to expand testing to match a rapidly spreading variant. Test people are coming into the country regardless of where they've come from because we're seeing that the Omicron variant is in, in several countries right now. We will continue to follow the best available advice from our public health care experts. Um, so we are always, we will always uh, reassess uh, what is appropriate at the border. Quebec has 115 travelers self-isolating while they wait for tests due to recent trips to one of the southern African countries on the no-travel list. Ontario Public Health is reaching out to 375 travelers. In Alberta, that number is 156. And in BC, 204. This will go very, very fast and therefore we need to take it very seriously. Whether Omicron makes people sicker than previous variants is still an open question. Some epidemiologists worry it is spreading faster. The message to Canadians, use the pandemic tools available. It's good masks, well fitted. It's good ventilation and, uh, and it's uh, getting vaccinated, two doses um, if, it's, uh, if it's recent. And if you can get a third dose already, get the third dose. It has never been more important. Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos met with G7 counterparts on the Omicron response, the new variant now detected on multiple continents. But since the travel ban targeting some African countries on Friday, Canada's announced no new measures. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Ottawa. The unknown dangers of the Omicron variant have become suddenly urgent, just as some countries with high vaccination rates were planning how to roll out booster shots. Tashana Reed shows us how this new concern is changing those plans. Carol Wortman was relieved to get her booster shot today. I thought, I want to be on top of this. <laughs> but now a new worry, the Omicron variant. Everything is so uncertain and in my head I will be more cautious around people or whatever just until we find out a little more about the variant. There are still many unknowns, including the effectiveness of our current vaccines against it. The virus may look a certain way, but how it behaves in a human population, especially with vaccines already out there, is the big gap in our knowledge. In response to the new variant, the UK expanded its booster eligibility to anyone over the age of 18, and the US president urged everyone to get a booster. If you're 18 years or over, and got fully vaccinated before June the 1st, 
go get the booster shot today. Here in Canada, provinces and territories have varying guidelines for who can get a booster shot, mostly elderly people or those at risk. Ontario health officials said they were already planning to expand eligibility. While boosters are effective against Delta, they can't be the only defensive measure against the new variant, says this virologist. We're going to need other public health measures to contain this, especially now that we know that there are cases that have made its way, their, their way into Canada. Vaccine makers are already busy working on this new challenge. We will be one at risk right now at the, for Omicron, but it will be used only in case we need it if we see that the current one doesn't work. Pfizer previously developed shots for the Beta and Delta variants, but didn't manufacture them because its current vaccine was already highly effective. Until we know more, health officials say the best options to keep Canadians safe are existing vaccines, masking, and following public health measures. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Now, in response to Omicron, Japan announced some of the broadest travel restrictions in the world. Unlike Canada or the U.S.'s ban targeting select countries in Africa, all foreign visitors are being banned from entering Japan and returning Japanese nationals will have to go into quarantine facilities. So far, Japan has zero confirmed cases of Omicron. Israel and Morocco have also temporarily closed their borders to foreign travelers. Now, some young Canadian athletes are among those caught in travel ban limbo. About 20 of them on the junior national women's field hockey team were set to compete in the biggest tournament of their lives until Omicron cancelled it and stranded them in South Africa. It was a bit crazy because like Thursday morning we woke up and our family members had texted us like, hey, look at, look at this new story. Like there's been a new variant of COVID discovered. Um, and... Then literally 12 hours later, like tournament was canceled. We had to find a way to get home. Um, so I think it all, all, it all came as quite a big surprise. And later in the program, we will show you how they're coping as we take a deeper dive into the impact of Omicron and the wisdom of travel bans. Right now, there is another exhausting waiting game underway in rain-soaked BC. Today was the lull, a short one, before a third back-to-back to back storm strikes. It will dump more rain on that already saturated ground and send more water into already swollen rivers. Today, the province announced gas rationing will continue for another two weeks and it extended the state of emergency. As Susanna De Silva shows us, people are really tired as they wait to see what comes next. <laughs> It's time to move out as the water moves in again. I'm watching a slow motion train wreck. I mean, it's just, you know, it's coming, but there's nothing you can do. You just sit here and watch, you know. It's frustrating. It's hard. This is what his recycling business looked like in the morning. Two hours later, this boat was almost ready to float off as floodwaters rolled over the U.S. border. You can see the high water mark from the last event. It went up about three feet. You know, our lunchroom and everything is still all part, torn apart. This water is still the result of this weekend storm. And while today at least provided a reprieve from the rain and perhaps a hopeful sign, the break is a brief one. The next storm is on deck. Yeah, I don't know what to say. I'm actually speechless. This farmer already didn't know if he could save his field, submerged first in catastrophic floods two weeks ago and again now. First time it was shocking, but now we're more prepared. It's a feeling echoed by the mayor of Abbotsford. And I feel much better today than I did yesterday at this point. Unless we get a 200 millimeter dump uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, that's a whole different ballgame then. Crews worked into the night to set up a dam to protect Highway 1 and are feeling confident about the dikes that have been repaired and reinforced. In hope, the weekend storm washed away some houses. It's not clear how many, but it has everyone worried about what comes next. They're a little bit anxious. Uh, they're, they're concerned uh, this next wave is going to cause some more flooding. So while everyone watches the skies, sandbags keep going down to try and protect as much as possible. So we really appreciate uh, the military coming in and helping us. So Susie, just listening to this, clearly this is a lull between the storms, but, but I guess that does not mean the threat is paused in any way. 
No, and if you look behind me, and perhaps you can even hear right now, the water continues to flow across this road from the U.S. into the farms over here. I just spoke to someone who's been driving around dropping off sandbags at nearby farms, and he says this water is making its way to farms further into Sumas Prairie. Now, earlier today, the province was able to reopen some of the highways that they had closed preemptively before this past weekend stormed. But they are already warning that they could need to close them again quickly. Adrian? Again, all right, Susie, thanks very much. Okay, Dan Burt in Vancouver is also tracking developments on this story tonight. Dan. Andrew, the weather has remained relatively stable so far tonight, but as Susanna mentioned, the main concern right now is those floodwaters crossing the American border into Abbotsford. Sandbagging efforts continued in the city late into the night. Massive piles like this being made available to anybody who wants them. Highway 1 between Abbotsford and Chilliwack is closed due to flooding, and other major roads could be shut down if need be. Avalanche Canada says dangers have risen in the mountains across the south coast and in the Sea to Sky region. Back in Abbotsford, some 90 homes are under an evacuation order tonight, but some homeowners have decided to stay behind. They say they're not complacent, though. This time around, yeah, we're just staying and watching, and we have our guidelines. We're three minutes from high ground we're packed ready to go so and it's not like a tsunami coming in it's a flood it's going to come in it's going to give us all all i need is 10 minutes and i'm out of here the gas rationing has also been extended meaning south coast drivers are being asked to limit themselves to 30 liters per fill up to ensure essential vehicles have enough fuel and canada post is warning of mail and parcel delivery delays because of closed roads andrew Okay, so all eyes are now on that approaching storm. Senior meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff here with those details. So, Joe, how much rain are we looking at here? Andrew, we're finally starting to hone in on those rainfall totals for the south coast. Very similar amounts to the storm we just saw. Let me show you the forecast rainfall that's actually hitting central and northern B.C. as we speak, along with heavy snow and strong winds. That will slide down to the south coast for pre-dawn hours, early Tuesday morning. And you can see the gray and white bullseye. That's the 100 plus millimeter mark. So for places like Abbotsford, Chilliwack, uh, even out towards Merritt, uh, looking to see double what we've just got through. Uh, on top of that, this is our warmest event yet, Andrew. So the tops of our local mountains uh, will be adding to that runoff. Andrew, it's been 24 hours only since each successive storm. Not enough time for waterways to return to normal. Yeah, and, and when we talk about that, water from the rivers themselves, that's the other big issue here, right? Absolutely. So the peak that we just saw from the weekend event, the highest that those rivers have crested, only just starting to come down. All waterways will be running fast and furious over the weekend. But take a look uh, at uh, a couple of points that I'm watching. First of all, the Nooksack River south of the border that floods northward. The forecast is for that to peak on Wednesday, slightly below what we saw on the weekend, but river channels have changed. Also, the Coldwater River near Merritt expected to peak on Thursday, Andrew. That may peak at similar levels to what we saw this weekend. It's just relentless. We do finally get a break after this uh, for more than 24 hours at a time. Okay, thanks very much, Joe. You're welcome. More water is also on the way for the already hard-hit southwest coast of Newfoundland. Repair work continued today on several washed out sections of the Trans-Canada Highway following last week's record rainfall. Environment Canada says the region could see another 60 to 80 millimeters of rain fall overnight and then into tomorrow along with wind gusts of up to 130 kilometers an hour. Well, one of the people violently arrested by Quebec City Police over the weekend is considering legal action. Today, his lawyer told Radio Canada that his client is shaken by the encounter and calls it an example of racial profiling. He doesn't understand why he's been treated that way by the police officer that arrested him that night, especially from the fact that he has nothing to reproach from himself or from something that he's done. It started Saturday evening when police were called to a bar. They started arresting people as they came out. Cell phone video shows a police officer dragging a young black woman through the snow by her hair. It also shows a young man pinned to the ground and being punched in the face several times. No charges have been laid. Quebec City police say they have launched an internal investigation. A multi-million dollar lawsuit alleges the Calgary Board of Education did not do enough to help hundreds of students who say they were sexually abused by a teacher for decades. Today, some of those students, who are now women, 
went public. Aaron Collins has the story, and we should say some of the details are upsetting. The accusations difficult to hear, harder to comprehend. My very first <clears throat> sexual experience was with my teacher at his house when I was 15. The pain from that assault nearly 20 years ago still raw today. I'm 34 now, and it has affected every single relationship I've ever had in my life. This man, Michael Gregory, is the alleged abuser. The former junior high teacher charged with 17 counts of sexual assault earlier this year. He killed himself just days later. Police say there were at least 16 victims, all students at this school where Gregory taught for 20 years. These women say they were among them and that other teachers and administrators knew, but any complaints about Gregory were ignored. It didn't go anywhere, and, and because it didn't go anywhere in 1989, it set the tone and the stage for how he could get away with it up until 2006. Now they've launched a class action suit seeking $40 million from Gregory's estate and the school board. This victim's advocate says the women's stories are all too common even today. We need to be prepared as a society to, to start dealing with this ugly reality um, and making sure that when people come forward, they get the support they deserve. Those behind this lawsuit hope they can help change that. I'm at the age where my friends have kids and I want to be having children and I don't want this to happen to anybody else ever, ever again. This class action suit has yet to be certified. And for its part, the Calgary Board of Education says it hasn't been formally served and will respond through legal avenues once they have. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. In New York today, a new window opened into the sordid life of the late financier Jeffrey Epstein. The trial of Ghislaine Maxwell got underway. She is accused of acting as Epstein's chief enabler, recruiting and grooming young girls for him to abuse. Chris Reyes was inside the courtroom. Reporters from around the world lined up as early as 6 a.m. to get inside the courtroom. Maxwell is facing six felony charges, including sex trafficking of minors all related to accusations that she recruited underage women for Jeffrey Epstein. The jet-setting multimillionaire was awaiting trial also for sex trafficking charges in 2019 when he was found dead in a New York City jail. You'll probably see her, Ghislaine Maxwell. The two have received global coverage, detailing their lavish lifestyle, their rich and famous friends, and the women who say they were sexually abused by Epstein and Maxwell. Prosecutors are expected to call on four different accusers to testify against Maxwell. This is not some sordid sex story. Another accuser, Virginia Dufre, isn't part of the case, but she has shared her story with the public, saying she was recruited by Maxwell. She was pulling the strings. She had his money. Yilin was much more conniving and smart than Epstein ever was. Maxwell has been in a detention center since her arrest 17 months ago. Highly anticipated in the trial, whether the British socialite will take the stand and if a so-called black book of contacts, allegedly full of high-profile names, will be revealed. Most defense lawyers would say that Galen Maxwell, under no circumstances, should testify in this case. Mm. So Chris, you were in the courtroom today for the opening yeah. arguments. What stood out to you? Well, Andrew, if opening statements are an indication, we're going to hear more sordid details. The prosecution today was very clear. For them, this is a trial about the sex trafficking of kids. But make no mistake, we're going to hear about two very different Ghislaine Maxwells. One side will claim that she is a dangerous predator who was the right-hand woman of Jeffrey Epstein. And the other will say that she is only on trial because Epstein is not, that she's being punished for what he did and that, in fact, she's only one of his many associates. Uh, Andrew, we can expect a verdict early in the new year. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Well, Ottawa has formally set a date to deliver an apology to victims of sexual misconduct in the Canadian forces. On December 13th, Defence Minister Anita Anand will be joined by the Chief of the Defence Staff and other top officials. They'll address survivors and victims of military sexual misconduct and offer an apology that was first promised in 2019. Tensions at the Russian-Ukrainian border continue to grow, and today NATO leaders and their militaries met in Latvia to deliver a message to the Kremlin. Chris Brown was there. 
This war game in snowy Latvia is meant to help soldiers from 30 NATO countries practice tactics and deal with possible military threats. The enemy goes unnamed, but most of the war gaming has that threat coming from the direction of the Russian border, 300 kilometers away. This is Operation Winter Shield, a simulated attack on the Latvian capital Riga, with forces from NATO defending. Canada has more than 500 soldiers in Latvia, and everyone is intensely aware that Russia has been amassing forces pointing at Ukraine, begging the crucial question of whether NATO would fight for Ukraine, which is not a member of the alliance. We talk about our possibilities and how we would employ ourselves, but it wouldn't be a decision that comes down, comes down to us. The best deterrence is always demonstrating our interoperability and demonstrating constantly that we can, we can go out and train. The head of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, was joined by Canada's Foreign Minister, Melanie Jolie, here on the eve of key meetings about the Ukraine situation. If there's a Russia attack, could you foresee a situation where Canada uh, would help Ukraine boots on the ground? We've always been there to support Ukrainians. Uh, as I said, we're a strong ally, and that's why we're monitoring the situation very closely. Support in the past has meant sanctions, not military intervention. There is a difference between a partner, uh, a non-member um, of the alliance, and uh, uh, members of NATO. Latvia, uh, 29 other countries are a member. Uh, Ukraine is not, but we provide support. Russia has accused NATO of building up its forces in Eastern Europe. As she talked to the troops, Jolie praised their work, but refused to say if Canada would be sending any extra to join them. Chris Brown, CBC News, near Riga, Latvia. Well, there are parties in Barbados tonight. Some are celebrating as the country cuts ties with the British monarchy. Coming up, we head to the Caribbean nation to find out why now. The white minority, by and large, still controls the economic direction. Plus, a COVID variant is once again upending travel plans. At the beginning of COVID, you heard of people who were kind of stuck in places, and, and now we're those people. <laughs> Canadians stranded and health experts weigh in on the merit of travel bans. But first. I'm in. Here we go. Tributes pour in after the death of an influential designer who changed luxury fashion. I think he took the door off of its hinges and threw it out. We're back in two. Well, one of social media's most powerful CEOs has quit. Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey stepped down as the company's chief executive today and plans to leave the board after his term expires next year. Dorsey says it's time for the company to move past its founder. He will be replaced by Twitter's current chief technical officer, Parag Agrawal. In his first interview since he was severely injured in a car crash last year, golf legend Tiger Woods says he may never return to form. In a talk with Golf Digest, he said he may likely have to pick and choose tournaments and will likely never return to being a full-time pro golfer. Well, tomorrow, French fashion house Louis Vuitton will hold a show featuring the work of Virgil Abloh. Well, today, fans and friends around the world mourn his death at a young age. The groundbreaking designer died from a rare type of cancer at just 41 years old. Eli Glasner on how, despite his age, he leaves behind an important legacy. What did Virgil Abloh bring to the fashion world? Take a look at his menswear collection for next summer, a fusion of high fashion and streetwear. His bold, playful creations found their way onto everything from the tennis court to the red carpet and even Ikea. Born in Chicago, Illinois, raised by Ghanaian immigrant parents, Abloh quickly connected with Kanye West and other musicians. He went on to launch his own label, Off-White, in 2018, he became the first black artistic director for Louis Vuitton. High fashion is not inclusive. High fashion is not um, a place that feels welcoming, especially for people who look like Virgil Abloh and like me. And what he did was say that high fashion is for us. That feeling of inclusion was something Abloh wrestled with. I still, to this day, am reluctant to call myself a designer because I believe that designers didn't look like me. But that was my biggest hurdle. But Abloh changed what high fashion could be. The way that Virgil not only put sneakers on the runway, but put, like, 
hoodies, which sounds so banal and basic, but really it was kind of groundbreaking in the way that he sort of did it. And not just kind of, not just the clothing, but who the clothing was on. While Abloh was dreaming up new visions and products, he was privately battling a rare form of cancer. Tomorrow, his spring-summer show will go on in Miami as a tribute to his genius. Although Abloh is gone as he fought cancer, he also launched a scholarship to bring more black talent through the doors he opened. I think he took the door off of its hinges and threw it out. So I'm, I'm really hopeful about this next generation. A lasting legacy for a designer greatly missed. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, more countries are enforcing travel bans to stop the spread of the Omicron variant, but health experts are divided. This is a total overreaction. I'm quite sure your this variant is already in some of most of these countries. We hear from Canadians stuck abroad. Plus, how much stock should we put in early reports that Omicron could be milder than other variants we've seen? I'll ask a doctor who studies how viruses evolve next. Welcome back. The Omicron variant of the coronavirus is shaking up people's lives around the world, Canadians included. We're taking the next few minutes to show you how that's playing out and to bring you the newest information on how much greater a threat this new variant might pose. As we noted earlier, Japan said today it is banning all foreign travelers, joining other countries that have in some way restricted travel over fears of the new variant, which was first detected in South Africa. So let's start with the human impact of those government decisions. Ellen Morrow introduces us to the people caught in the middle of policy. Canada's junior field hockey team had World Cup dreams, but the tournament's been cancelled and they're stuck in South Africa. It's a bit crazy. I was talking to some of the other girls, you know, at the beginning of COVID, you heard of people who were kind of stuck in places and, and now we're those people. <laughs> A web of international travel restrictions from Canada and others targeting South Africa and its neighbours, even as the Omicron variant is now being detected in countries around the world. This doctor was the first to flag it. This is a total overreaction. I'm quite sure your this variant is already in some most of these countries. The World Health Organization has also denounced the measures, while South Africa's president described them like this. Unscientific travel restrictions that only serve to further disadvantage developing economies. A sentiment echoed by George Kwa Inu. He lives in Pretoria, his kids in Ontario. Luckily, I'm not traveling, but if I were to come back to visit my kids for Christmas, that would have been devastating. Some experts argue travel bans can slow the spread of a virus, but the benefit goes down as it's found in more places. Canadian officials say there's no plans yet to change course, but other measures would be more helpful, says Dr. Zane Chagla. Imposing perhaps a test on entry and a short quarantine period on entry until test results are back, it's probably not an unreasonable way to mitigate as much of the risk as possible. Charles Kutsia is in South Africa from BC, visiting his 80-year-old father who's been facing health issues. Since I've, I've arrived, it felt like the bulk of my time has been going into figuring out how to get back home again, uh, you know, instead of attending to what I actually came here for. So it is incredibly uh, frustrating. Precious time lost to a policy that may not have the intended effect. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Now, much depends on whether Omicron is actually more of a threat than all those other variants that have come and mostly gone. Some colleagues are still suggesting we don't know whether it's more transmissible. That's absolutely not true. What we see now uh, in South Africa is it took about three weeks from 5% of Omicron to 95% of Omicron, which shows you we have an issue there and we need to take it seriously. So that fear that it could be more contagious might have to do with this, the first 3D image of the variant. Researchers say it has many more mutations than the Delta variant, and they're concentrated in the part of the virus that interacts with human cells. So for more on the potential impact of the Omicron variant, I'm joined right now by Dr. Samira Mubaraka in Toronto. She is a virologist at the Sunnybrook Research Institute. Hello, uh, Dr. Mubaraka. How are you? How are you, Andrew? Good, thank you for making the time. Uh, Dr. Mubaraka, the, the early reports out of South Africa seemed to suggest that 
while the variant is spreading alarmingly quickly, that the symptoms had been quite mild. What, if anything, mm -hmm. should we read into that? I would not read too much into that. Um, those data are pretty limited. We don't really know much about those patients, except for that there are few of them. Um, so it will take time. It will take time to really understand the severity of, of disease that's associated with this particular variant. Like we've seen um, that pattern emerge in the past. Um, and I think that's why it's important that we move very quickly to identify cases so that we can follow them and understand what the implications of this variant is, you know, not just at the patient level, but at the viral level and the population level as well. And do we know if this variant is more or less infectious than others circulating right now, uh, Delta, for example? That's going to be a key question. So again, um, something that we're watching incredibly closely, it's certainly possible that it's more transmissible. Um, and what we need to understand is whether that is the case, number one, and if so, to what degree, and how that might vary based on the population and, and rates of vaccination, for example. So how do I gauge risk here? I mean, you know, from the perspective of someone who has been vaccinated, what, if anything, should I be doing to adjust in my daily life for the fact that Omicron exists, not just in the world, but here in Canada? So vaccination is a really important layer of protection. Um, and it's something that obviously without it, we would be much more susceptible to any of the SARS coronaviruses. Um, but having said that, we can't really let our guard down being fully vaccinated. Um, and in the meantime, as we try to, you know, roll out vaccines, not just within Canada, but at a global level, we should be paying very close attention to those efforts as well. And I think we also need to start to understand in more granular detail um, whether or not or to what degree vaccination is, is protective. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, when it comes to boosters or third doses, for those folks here in Canada who are eligible for them, but who have yet to get them, does this change the calculation in terms of how urgently they should be seeking those additional shots out? Yeah, so again, we're still missing a lot of data. I don't think we can make policy recommendations based on what we know at this time on Omicron, right? Um, I would follow NASI recommendations. Obviously, there are go-to body and, and, and really the experts in this area. One more question I want to put to you, if I could. We, we have yet to see a Delta-specific booster. Is it plausible mm -hmm. to think that we would need an Omicron booster? I mean, give, again, give, given what you've just said about how little we know about it. We don't know yet, right, if, if, if that will be necessary or not. But uh, we're very fortunate in that um, you know, the virologists in South Africa and their colleagues have shared the sequence of this virus. That's really enabled a vast amount of science to move forward. And that includes um, the science on, on vaccine development. Dr. Mubaraka, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Now, if you have questions about the Omicron variant, you can send an email to ask at cbc.ca and we'll put those questions to our experts. Next on The National, Barbados cuts ties with the throne. Bringing 396 years of British monarchical rule to an end says to every Barbadian boy and girl that they can be the best that they can be. We're in the country's capital as it marks its first moments as a republic. Stay with us. This is a big night for Barbados, marked by big celebration. After hundreds of years under British monarchy, the small island in the Caribbean is shedding the crown to become a republic. Barbados gained its independence in 1966, but the queen has remained its head of state. That ends tonight. Thomas Dagla is in Barbados's capital, watching it all unfold. Thomas, can you take us through what's happening there right now? We've been listening to a speech from uh, the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, who's just right now um, presenting an honour to uh, probably the country's best-known citizen, Rihanna. Uh, also, of course, here tonight, the new president of Barbados, who has been sworn in as the first president of this new republic, in the presence, of course, of Prince Charles as well, who is here representing his mother, no longer the head of state here. For many in this country, this night has been a long time coming. 
centuries in the making, this is one party for the ages. Long known as the Caribbean's Little England, but no more. Barbados is going off on its own and wants the world to know. The inevitable is happening. The British monarchy has fallen like a leaf in autumn in Barbados. Renowned for its sand and sun, this country has a cruel history. The English arrived on these shores nearly 400 years ago, imposing their rule on generations. We sang God Save the Queen, and then there was a certain reverence for it. It was a colonial society. Even in Ralph Jamot's living memory, apartheid was the unwritten reality. He wouldn't have felt welcome at this yacht club. If you saw black people around here, I'll have no word to be workers, you know, waiters. And um, the white minority, by and large, still controls the economic direction. They still have the, the, the wealth. The hope is making Barbadians citizens of their own republic will make them feel in greater control of their own destiny. Having, for the first time, a head of state from the black majority amid a global reckoning over racial injustice and colonialism. Long time coming and no time like the present. It's just to know that the head of your state would be a Barbadian, that's important for uh, morale. There is like a mother child, but now the child is going independent. Child's grown up. Yeah, it's grown up. It's been a long road to get here, and it all began in the sugarcane fields. African slaves were forced to work in brutal conditions, a system developed by the British here and later exported to the southern U.S. Barbados wants reparations for the atrocities of slavery, and experts like Tennyson Joseph hope removing the British monarch will help bolster the case for compensation. It actually was a, a, a black mark on, democ on, on Barbadian democracy. It was one thing to make a demand for, for reparations overseas, and yet on your own internal space, you have not done anything to, to fully decolonize. Barbados gained independence 55 years ago, but Queen Elizabeth remained head of state until now. So there will be no more inspecting the troops by a British monarch. And Prince Charles will never become king of this country. Still, he was invited here. He's even being awarded Barbados's highest honor, a parting gift of sorts. Some consider that an insult. He sent a very, very bad message because the queen and her family benefited from slavery. Wearing her country's colors gold and blue, that's Sandra Mason, the first ever president of Barbados, until now the governor general. She'll replace the queen as head of state. Prime Minister Mia Motley spearheaded the plan without putting it to a public vote. Some ask why now? Why a republic in the middle of a pandemic? Choosing instead to move forward, confident of the public's backing. Prime Minister for Canada, what uh, message uh, are you sending to other Commonwealth nations? My message first and foremost is really to Barbadians. Um, we're conscious that, that others will watch us, but we believe first that we need to complete the process of independence. If we are going to face the world with confidence, then we need to do so as whole as we can. The day after independence happens, or the transition to a republic, how is that going to change the life of people in your country. Bring in 396 years of British monarchical rule to an end says to every Barbadian boy and girl that they can be the best that they can be. With the country's colors on display across the island, there's a sense of history being made. Generations after slaves had their lives stolen, their descendants are reclaiming what they can. Now the new president is addressing Barbados for the first time as president of this country. Prince Charles has spoken and uh, knowing that Barbados will remain a member of the Commonwealth, he, he told the crowd here that uh, this country's partnership will, the UK, with the UK will endure. And crucially here, he also mentioned the appalling atrocity of slavery which forever stains our history. That will be of great interest uh, for those in this country demanding reparations from the British. This country is now the world's newest republic, Adrian. All right, Thomas Degla in Bridgetown, Barbados on a historic night. We want to show you a preview of something we'll bring you tomorrow night. The story of a Quebec woman and her incredible survival after months in captivity. 
Held hostage in the Sahara Desert for 450 days, Canadian Edith Blay was in trouble until the bravest of decisions to make a break for it in the middle of the night. Well, I didn't think we, we have nothing to lose. This isn't a story of negotiation or rescue, just luck and determination to save herself. How she did it, tomorrow on The National. And next on The National, if you're looking for a Christmas tree, you better snag one fast. Selection this year seems about the lowest that we've seen for the 18 years that we've been cutting down trees. Why scarcity may be here to stay, next. Welcome back. For some, the smell of a Christmas tree is a big part of kicking off the season. But this year, some might be in for disappointment as a combination of factors, including climate change, has sparked a shortage. Here's Jamie Strachan. At this Ontario tree farm, the quest for the perfect tree is on. So we came out a couple of weeks earlier. Um, and even for us, we were thinking it was a little bit late for us to come out. Among shoppers, there is a sense of urgency. Last year, we waited, I think, until the second week of December, uh, and it was really slim picking. Farmers across the country say demand is up about 15% and inventory is tight. It's going to be fast and furious. I think that we will sell out really quickly. So this one here is a balsam fir. And Shirley Brennan says the supply issue has been snowballing for at least a decade. In 2011, about 70,000 acres of Christmas trees were planted in Canada. By 2016, that was down to less than 60,000 acres and is expected to shrink again this year, as some farms turn to more lucrative crops, meaning millions fewer trees in the ground. Because we're losing acreage, we're losing trees. So if we've lost 10,000 acres in five years, we've lost a lot of opportunities to plant trees. Basically, Extreme weather also hasn't helped. Some of them were totally underwater. 80-year-old like Arthur Lowen has never seen anything like it on his BC farm. This month's historic flooding hurt many young seedlings, but it was this summer's heat dome that really did the most damage. We get burning on the new growth. They can't take that heat. And some of those uh, are probably not going to recover from it. And early summer frost in some parts of the country also severely damaged thousands of trees. Add it up and not every family will go home happy. Selection this year seems about the lowest that we've seen for the 18 years that we've been cutting down trees. This family search continues, finding a Christmas tree harder than ever. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, a school in Regina that is now rewarding good deeds with good reads. I picked one of the Babysitter's Club books. The backstory in our moment. So here's a bit of history for you. This is one of the first vending machines for books, dub dubbed the Penguin Cubator. Yikes, it was made in 1937, a self-service machine that spat out page turners. So it's not exactly a novel idea, if you catch my drift, but in one Regina school, students can now snag themselves a book from their vending machine without having to fork over any cash, and that is our moment. If you want a book from the vending machine, you have to like have good attendance, be kind in school, follow the Kitchener code. It's not hard to do that, so everyone could get a token. You just have to try. So our Kitchener code covers um, respect, kindness, um, good citizenship within our building, positivity, um, helpfulness, any of those ways they can earn that golden token from their um, teacher or a staff member within our building and then come and choose a book of their liking. I was helping a student with their work. Me and another student were called to the office and they said you can pick a book from the vending machine. I picked one of the Babysitter's Club books. Many students have limited access to resources at home so this is another way to get more books um, into their hands to take home with them um, and it's a way to add um, some literacy and opportunities to read with their family members. 
Hmm. This is a great idea. Yeah. And weird fact here, this idea came 1822, the first one, and it was from a bookseller who didn't want to go to jail for selling seditious books, so he put them in a machine, ah, put your money, uh, get your book. Interesting Nobody roots. goes to jail. Yeah. I, I, great idea, mm -hmm. as you said. I would totally be the kid who hoards tokens, though. Oh, come <laughs> that's, on. That's my problem. <laughs> I, I would just fan them out and say, look what I've earned. That's the National for this November 29th. No, I would get a book. <laughs> Good night. Good night.